Red shift here, doing my part, shift perceptions out of the pink and into the red. Okay, this is going to be a video about coronavirus. I made a video uh, based on this before, but I think I uh, rewrote the script and so it should be shorter. It was like almost two hours long. I, I, maybe I did it without a script and then I wrote the script to shorten it up, but it still ended up being really long. Whatever, um, this is going to be a long video, but it should be it should be shorter than the original video I made, which is like an hour and 45 minutes. Although I think this might actually be longer than the coronavirus part of that video because I kind of combined that video with another topic I've been wanting to talk about and then I went way longer talking about that topic than I expected. But anyway, um, I had some things I wanted to say about coronavirus and that was, the script goes like this. People these days do not have the courage of the people of the past and this is something that causes them to give up their rights in order to supposedly get security from government. If every time something bad happens we allow the government to take more of our rights to supposedly deal with the problem or to supposedly prevent the problem from happening again or to supposedly better deal with the problem the next time it occurs, if we do this every time something bad happens then we will end up with zero freedom. Zero. And one good thing about the coronavirus is that we have the chance to force people to learn that we don't need government to deal with problems. If we spread coronavirus like crazy on purpose so that everyone in the entire country gets it, then we could force everyone to realize that bad things happen and you cannot give up your rights to supposedly get protected from something bad happening. Americans are like little children these days, both the people of the new generations and the older people. Americans are scared of everything and are willing to give up their freedoms for security. This is a horrific tendency in people. And and by the way, little red shift aside here that's not in the script. Oh my god, I went I went downtown protesting. I held up a sign and and I, and on one on one side it said usdebtclock.org, but mostly I showed the other side on on this other side of the sign which I wrote um what did I write? I wrote um son of a bitch, what did I wrote? Oh yeah, I wrote the um 150 trillion dollar US debt is way scarier than coronavirus. That's what I wrote on my sign. The 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 150 trillion dollar US debt is way scarier than coronavirus. I wrote that and I held it up, right? And and, and I went down there and and I was holding it up and and it was just there were so few cars. It, it, it's it's just like it's absolutely astonishing when you go downtown right at the peak of the time, you know, like six o'clock or five-ish, you know, you go downtown at that time and, and there should be tons of people everywhere, everybody in the stores, everybody in the restaurants, people walking down the streets, tons of cars driving all different ways, but there was like not very many cars. There's probably, I don't know, maybe somewhere between like, you know, maybe a tenth and a third of as many cars as there are normally. And there's hardly anybody in any of the businesses. It was fucking crazy. It was nuts, and I was like, oh my god, this is how cowardly people are. I mean, if all the old people want to stay home because they're scared because they don't have strong immune systems, they don't want to die, I get it. I don't blame them for wanting to stay home. But all these middle-class, young, healthy people who should not be scared of coronavirus in the slightest, and they're staying home too? That is crazy. That is absolutely nutso. And, and, and if you want to know how easy it would be to win against liberals in a civil war, all you have to do is look at how cowardly they are regarding coronavirus. Even all the young people, most of the middle-aged people too, so scared of coronavirus, they won't go out at all unless they're in their car. And even then, you know, most of them are not even out in their car, you know, not even driving around or anything. And, and pff, there's virtually no one in any of the stores. I mean, Jesus Christ, like they are so cowardly. This is just absolute proof that they are so incredibly cowardly. It would be the easiest thing in the world to win a civil war against liberals. The easiest thing in the world. It would be as easy as a, as a typical average guy fighting a typical average woman in an octagon. You know, the average guy is going to absolutely decimate a woman in the octagon. Same thing. If the conservatives tried to have a civil war, they would win against the liberals so easy, it wouldn't even be a contest. It would be like, you know, odds 99 to 1 that the conservatives would win, even though the government would be on the liberals' side. You know, it's just, it's just, you have to view this kind of cowardice as just an absolute sign that we are being idiots for not even trying to overthrow the country and trying, you know, to get rid of the liberals, like, you know, balkanize the country or something. I mean, the fact that we're not doing it, even though the liberals are so incredibly cowardly, is just either proof that the conservatives are super deluded and idiots, 
or they're super scared of the government, or they're just super, super cowardly, just like the liberals. I mean, it's just really, really, really astonishing. But like I said, Americans are scared of everything and are willing to give up their freedoms for security. This is a horrific tendency of people. And it's a tendency that was not possessed by the people who started this country. And it's a tendency that is not possessed by the people of free countries. That's why we're not a free country anymore. Because we have this cowardly attitude of being willing to give up our freedoms to the government just so we can hopefully empower the government enough so that it can hopefully prevent bad things from happening to us. If everyone got coronavirus and the government did nothing, then nothing bad would happen. Sure, a few million people would die, but it would mainly be old people, you know? And, and so and so it's like, yeah, old people would die anyway, you know what I mean? <coughs> it's better to permanently lose a bunch of our rights, or it, you have to ask yourself, you know, is it better to permanently lose a bunch of our rights, or is it better to preserve our rights and allow a few million old people to die five years earlier than they otherwise would have because, you know, they're 65 years old and they would have died at 69 or 70, but, you know, coronavirus comes along and kills them five years earlier. Oh, it's such a tragedy. They missed out on five years of life. Okay, yeah, I guess it's a little bit of a tragedy, but it's not so much of a tragedy. We have to give up all our rights to prevent it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, death happens. Like, get back in touch with reality. People die. Nothing can stop that, you know? And, and besides, old people are useless anyway. You know, they're low in testosterone, and thus they're unwilling to wage a revolutionary war to get freedom back. They're, they're low in testosterone, and thus unwilling to wage a civil war to balkanize the country. They're old and hedonistic and cowardly, and they don't want to wage a revolutionary war. They're old and weak and slow and stupid, and hence they don't have the ability to wage a revolutionary war. Even if they wanted to, they wouldn't be able to, you know, because they're too feeble. Uh, at least a lot of them are, not all of them, but um, not even if the rest, people of the younger generations helped them, could they really help us much. At least a lot of the old people. Some of them are still pretty vital, they could, but, you know, a lot of them are useless. Old people are useless to help us fight a revolutionary war, and thus old people are enemies of freedom. Old people are stupid and set in their ways, and thus are not keeping up with the red pill truths being revealed, such as the red pill truths about World War II Germany, red pill truths about female nature, about, you know, red pill truths about the petrodollar, and and, and truths about the tyranny, such as the voting machines being coded so the voting can be changed, so that the voting is completely subverted and completely worthless. You know, old people don't want to learn these truths, and they are not able to assimilate the new worldview the learning these truths requires. So since old people are cowardly and feeble and unable to learn red pill truths, this means that old people are utterly worthless. If we let the coronavirus run rampant so that people, and plus, a lot of them, they're retired. They're not even working. So it's not like they're producing anything for society. They're just sucking up Social Security money. They are literally worthless. And if they had, the, if they had too much cowardice when they were in their teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s to overthrow the government, you really think now that they're really old and weak and, and low in testosterone, you really think now they're going to have the courage to overthrow the government? I don't think so. You know what I mean? Especially since most of them are unprincipled. And so even though you could view your impending death in the next 10 years due to old age as an inspiring thing to cause you to risk your life because you have nothing to lose anyway because you're old, you know, it's like you're going to die soon anyway, so why not fight a revolutionary war? Yeah, but that, that kind of viewpoint takes principles. And most of the boomers are not principled people. Maybe their grandfathers were, but they're not. And, and so... It's a, and probably not even their grandfathers, probably only their great-grandfathers are principled. Um, and, and so it's a situation of, like, if they didn't overthrow the government back when they were younger, they're not going to do it now. So they're, they're just totally worthless, the old people are. If we let the coronavirus run rampant so that everybody in the world got it, most people would survive and everything would be fine. In fact, it would kill a lot of old people, and thus those old people would not have to be paid their Social Security. And considering the old people, the baby boomers, threw generations X, Y, and Z under the bus by not getting rid of the government when it became tyrannical and thieving several decades ago, they therefore deserve to be allowed to get coronavirus. If they live, fine. I'm not, I, I'm not like trying to be like, oh, they gotta die, they gotta die. I'm just saying like, you know, if they survive the coronavirus, great. And if they don't survive it, Hey, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. But they don't deserve to be specially protected, especially at the cost of our tax dollars, especially since it's going to take even more of our freedoms away, too. You know, they tolerated tyranny. They tolerated the growth of tyranny when they were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And they paid taxes to fund the growth of tyranny. They did this when they were younger. And, and, and so, you know, <laughs> why should we look out for them? You know, considering they don't do any good for the country right now, they're worthless, literally worthless, this further means that they should not be protected from coronavirus, especially since stopping the spread of coronavirus is going to be very expensive. There's no reason we should give up our rights to protect baby boomers from dying just a few years earlier than they would die of natural causes of old age anyway. 
You know, we need to toughen the public up so that the public once again realizes that death is a natural reality of life. We need to force the public to realize that giving up your rights to try to stop something inevitable like death is the height of foolishness. Embrace death or embrace slavery. That's your choice. You don't have to die, but you do have to accept the reality of death if you want to be free. You have to accept the necessity to accept things that may result in your death if you want to be free. Otherwise, you'll always sacrifice freedom for security and thus you'll end up completely enslaved. The coronavirus will make everyone's immune system stronger if you survive. You know, kind of like the immune systems of doctors. Doctors almost never get sick because they're always around sick people, so their immune systems have gotten super strong. Sure, their immune systems are stronger than the average person's, you know, already because, you know, they have better genes, which is also why they have higher IQs. IQ and, you know, reflexes, you know, nervous system health are correlated. But basically, it's also because... They, uh, they, they see a lot of sick people all the time, so their immune systems get super strong. You know, it's, it's the opposite of, you know, the people who raise their son in a bubble and, and you know, or, you know, maybe not literally in a bubble, but, you know, like they don't, they're very, very worried about germs, so they never let their kid go out and experience any germs or anything. Those kids grow up to have super weak immune systems because they didn't get enough exposed to enough germs when they were, old, when they were younger. You see, so the, immune, the doctors are the opposite. They get exposed to tons of germs, so they're super strong in terms of immune system. You know, so the coronavirus will make everybody's immune system stronger if they survive it. So that's a good thing. Or it'll kill the person because he or she is too weak. Either too weak from being old, which is fine because they're old anyway, or because they just have bad genes, in which case, well, it's unfortunate, but, you know, it's eugenic. It's better in the long run for the species. That's evolution. That's how you make things better. Hardships make people stronger. The strong live to reproduce so that humanity gets stronger. The sickly and the excessively weak end up dying. I don't like it because I'm a compassionate person and I hope the weak can strengthen themselves as much as possible so that they can survive, but their survival or their death needs to be their own affair. You know, if they're young enough, that is in their 50s or younger, and if they've eaten healthy and kept their body healthy through regular exercise, if they've taken good care of themselves, whether they're old or young, then they'll be healthier and they'll have a, <clears throat> a better chance of surviving. Right? Trying to stop the spread of coronavirus is like trying to ra is like raising your child in a sterile environment to make sure that your child doesn't die. All that does is weaken your child's immune system so that your child will then not be able to go outside without always getting sick when they're an adult. And then your child will have to stay inside for the rest of his or her life. Coddling people makes people weak. That's not the way to deal with threats. The way to deal with threats is to make people as strong as possible so as to enable them to not get taken down by hardships so that will inevitably happen. Want to keep your daughter from getting raped? Well, you could hide her away and never le let her leave the house, or you could teach her martial arts so that she's free to go anywhere she wants to at any time because she's highly skilled at defending herself and can thus defend herself if someone tries to rape her or rob her, or even if multiple people try to harm her or, or rape her. You know, she can kick all their asses because she's, you know, a fifth degree black belt in some really good martial art or something. You know, want to keep old people from dying? Sorry, it's impossible. Want to keep old people from dying earlier than they have to? Then have the food in the country be healthy and have a culture that shames people for being fat or being muscularly weak due to those weak people lazily neglecting to lift weights. Have a country that encourages people to eat healthy and regularly exercise to stay thin and fit. Want to keep people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s from dying young? Encourage them to do the same thing. Eat healthy, do weightlifting, do cardio, stretch, be around sick people as much as possible so as to get your immune system as strong as possible. Do Zhang Zhuang, do Tai Chi Chuan, take multivitamins, get fresh air on a regular basis, etc., etc. Don't have too much sex if you're a guy. And if everyone does everything right, people will still die. It's unavoidable. And the only mature and rational and freedom-enabling attitude is to just accept that people are going to die no matter what we do. People will die from shark bites every year no matter what we do to stop it. People, including children, will die in pools every year. It's unavoidable. Should we outlaw swimming at the beach so that no one gets killed by sharks? Should we outlaw the sale of pools so that nobody can have a pool at their house so that no child dies from drowning? Of course not. So we should not try to stop coronavirus either. We should just accept that it will kill people and that it's unfortunate that that has to happen, but that it's unavoidable. Spending astronomical sums of money to prevent the spread of coronavirus and telling people not to go outside or to stay away from large groups of people when outside when they are outside is not a solution. It's cowardly, unsustainable nonsense that will that could very well destroy the economy. I mean, from what I saw, uh, oh my God, just like uh, so few people out there. It was ridiculous. It, it made me think, holy shit, not only are these people super cowardly, but goddamn, dude, this is, how could this not lead? If this is exactly what it's like all across the country, how could this not lead to a recession which quickly turns into a massively great depression? How could this not? I mean, I'm not saying it will, but I mean, looking at, at what it was like, it was just like 
horrific. You know what I mean? It's just so shocking that I couldn't help but think that, like, this could easily, easily cause a new a massive recession or depression. I, I kept thinking, like, wow, these people are cowards. We're going to get a re We could easily, easily get a recession, which turns into a depression over this. And so many of these businesses are going to go out of business if this keeps on like this. I mean, if it, if it keeps it going on like this for weeks or a couple of months or something... This could drive a ton of businesses out of business because it's not like Americans are rich. It's not like they have a lot of money socked away or anything because the government's always nickel and diming us to, liter to literally like death, you know, to like we have no money at all. And, and so like so many businesses like they, they, they don't have a lot of money stored away for hard times. So when something like this happens, it can tr easily drive them out of business because they're on the edge already. You know what I mean? They're sustainable, but like. They, they, they don't have a lot of extra money, so, like, they can't weather a hard time like this. Like, you know, being out, getting hardly any customers for, you know, a month or two or three or whatever. I mean, if this goes on, it's gonna, it could annihilate the economy. If, the, if it's this bad all across the country. I mean, I don't know, maybe conservative areas of the country will fare way better. But if, if the liberal country, parts of the country start a recession or a depression, that's gonna affect the conservative areas of the country, too. Even if the conservatives are not being cowardly like the liberals and are not, you know, refusing to go outside. And if all the conservatives are still shopping and going to restaurants and everything else, it still could, the liberals alone could, you know, trigger a, a recession and then that massively will affect the conservatives too. It's just, you know, what, what the government is telling people to do now is just cowardly, unsustainable nonsense. On the one hand, taking the boomers out by letting them get coronavirus would make it so that lots of money would not have to be wasted giving them Social Security. But on the other hand, it would also make the government not crash from economic insolvency as quickly. And so that would kind of be a bad thing. You know, that would mean the government would be able to continue to enslave people more and more as the decades go by, because the government would not crash as quickly. So maybe it's better to not spread coronavirus, because then the old people stay alive, and they keep sucking up money from the government, thus pissing off the sheeple and stoking the fires of revolutionary war so that we can get rid of the government and then have ANCAP or libertarianism or something way, way better, so that then we can get an, an economic miracle like happened during World War II in Germany, you know, which is what happens when you have freedom. You know, you, an economic miracle can happen, you know, within like five or ten years. So, you know, maybe it's better if we don't spread coronavirus so that the old people can keep on sucking that Social Security money and destroy the government that way, you know. So, on the one hand, spreading the virus could toughen the public up so we stop accepting the necessity of government or the idea that we need to be protected from every threat or the government needs to protect us from every threat. And then maybe we start trying to prepare and protect ourselves as well as accept that bad things happen and that sometimes there's nothing you can do to prevent it or stop it. And hence it means giving up, and hence if it means giving up freedom to prevent or stop something, then you should not even try to prevent or stop that thing. Because freedom is more important than life. That's why Americans used to say, give me liberty or give me death. Because death is better than slavery, because freedom is literally more important than life. There's no such thing as freedom when government is large. We do not have freedom. If you think that America is still a free country, then you are woefully ignorant, as well as extremely deluded. So you could look at it as a matter of it being a matter of opinion whether you can effectively fight the government by getting the government to maintain its own economic unsustainability by allowing the government to save the old people and thus have to keep paying the old people their social security, or you can choose to you know, uh, spread coronavirus instead and toughen the public up, as well as wage economic warfare against America by causing lots of businesses to go bankrupt due to a spread of coronavirus and thus increase unemployment and increase, you know, the pressure on the government, you know, like more people collecting welfare and whatnot, right? Everybody, what people, everybody way more angry at the government for the high unemployment rate, way more people wanting to overthrow the government, etc., um, pretty much all freedoms lost or never regained until there's a revolutionary war that is fought and won. Only then can a people regain their freedoms. We still have not gotten our freedoms back after 9-11. They took our rights away with the Patriot Act and then the Freedom Act, which extended the Patriot Act, which was, um, and, and then they took, they took our rights away and they never gave them back. It's been almost 20 years and we still don't have our rights back. There has not been a major terrorist attack since then. And the government has failed to thwart any major terrorist plots then either. I mean, yeah, they claim they've foiled a bunch of plots and stuff, but when you look at those plots, all those plots were FBI plots that the FBI started. They found people that they thought would go along with some revolutionary, 
some you know terrorist plot and and then they you know befriended these people over a long period of time these people are usually stupid like even literally retarded and, and then the, the FBI you know convinces them that they should do a terrorist attack and then the FBI provides them with a fake bomb and then the FBI arrests them and claims to have stopped a terrorist attack i mean these people are literally like retarded or borderline retarded the people who they're arresting so these people never would have even tried to do a terrorist attack ne let alone known how to do it or how to make a bomb they never could have done any of that on their own without the FBI. And, and so, you know, these so-called terrorist plots that have been foiled by the government have not been real terrorist plots at all. The real terrorist plots, the government has not stopped one, as far as I know. Like, I, I've heard from several different places that uh, maybe this was, you know, a couple years ago or whatever, but as of just, you know, a few years ago, not that long ago, the government had not stopped a single terrorist attack, a real, not a single real terrorist attack. You see, so there's really no reason to give up your rights because you get no benefit from it. You know, they, they claim they need these powers so that they can stop another attack, but, you know, you give them the powers and then they don't stop another attack. Yeah, maybe more attacks happen, but, you know, the government didn't stop them. And then the ones that it does stop weren't, were not real ones, that they were fake plots that it started, the government started. You know, the FBI entraps people and then gets the people, the supposed material, the fake bomb to do an attack with after convincing the person to do an attack. And then the FBI swoops in and claims that it stopped the terrorist attack, even though the only reason that so-called terrorist attack was happening at all was because the FBI made it all happen, even to the point of the FBI providing the fake bomb for the supposed terrorist to use. So basically, there's zero reason for the U.S. government to have taken our rights away with the Patriot Act. Act, because the Patriot Act and the Freedom Act have not stopped any terrorist plots. So there's no reason to keep such tyrannical laws legal, and retrospectively, we can see that such tyrannical acts were not necessary in the first place. You know, acts meaning like the, the laws, like uh, the Patriot Act or whatever. Let's say we spread coronavirus to take the government down. Well, if our attempt fails and the government is not destroyed by the coronavirus spreading, you know, destroying the economy and all that, then government will just use the coronavirus to get stronger, even more tyrannical. Use the excuse of it. Like, like we got to create a, like, a diseases, like something like a, something like the CDC, but a separate agency, this whole new big agency to deal with this kind of stuff, right? Like, they'll create even more government agencies and then take even more rights. Like, you know, we got to be able to control the movements of people because, you know, it, it, there's got, we got to be able to get people off the streets if there's another virus. You know, like, they'll take more of our freedoms, they'll spend even more money, they'll take, you know, they'll, It'll just be utterly horrific, you know, and with that, with that so-called, you know, preventative agency, they'll probably just do stuff like, you know, creating the next virus instead of actually, you know, like trying to figure out how to stop the next virus. That's what government does. It makes weapons or, or it farms it out to multinational corporations to make its weapons for it. Like that's the only thing good the government does. And it's not good morally, but the only thing effectively the government does is make weapons. But even that is usually done by the corporations. You know, so the government could use the coronavirus as an excuse to get even bigger, even more tyrannical, even more expensive, etc. So maybe attacking the government by spreading the coronavirus will be counterproductive and will make the government stronger instead of weaker. But on the other hand, how, does, how often does such a perfect opportunity as coronavirus come along? How often do you get such a perfect chance to destroy the government? I mean, the U.S. government is so fragile that we could probably easily destroy the U.S. economy by spreading coronavirus. How often does such a perfect weapon like coronavirus come along? I mean, it's not just an annoyance like the flu. It's lethal to about 4% of the population, although most of those are probably old people. Um, at least, you know, as of Monday, I think it was, on Tucker Carlson, uh, he showed uh, that there had been like 181,000 cases, 7,000 fatalities, and like 70,000 recoveries. You know, so 10 times as many recovers, recoveries as deaths. But, you know, 181,000 cases, so presumably, you know, the other... 110,000 or 100,000 cases or so were um, perhaps, you know, not recovered yet, but they had not died yet either. Um, so, yeah, that's about a death rate of about 4%. You know, 7,000 out of 181,000, that's around 4%, right? So it's not, it's not just an annoyance, the coronavirus. But yet, at the same time, it's not like killing like 30 or 40% of the people who get the virus. You know, it's not killing a bunch of young people and all that, too. So it's not, it's not, a da it's not so dangerous that you would be really foolish to spread it. And that you don't want to get it, you get it yourself so that you can spread it because, you know, you could die. It's like, it's the perfect disease because it's lethal, but at the same time, it's only lethal to the old people who deserve it and, and who, you know, we shouldn't really worry about anyway. And, and it's only lethal to 4% 
of the people. So, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s and you're really healthy and you don't have any of those risk factors that would make it, you know, possibly lethal for you, you could go out and get the virus and it's only going to give you mild symptoms. And even if it gives you severe symptoms, you'll recover just fine and probably pretty fucking quickly. I got swine flu, you know, 10 years ago or so or whenever it was, and it wiped me out for an entire day. You know, I slept and, and then and then I just kept on sleeping almost all day, late, late, late. You know, like maybe one or two in the afternoon, I woke up and, and then I was up for a, an hour or two and then I went right back to sleep and I slept for another, I don't know, 18 hours or something. You know, that's all it did. And then I woke up the next day and I was, I was pretty much fine. So, you know, I, you know, I doubt that coronavirus is much worse than swine flu. You know, that, that big swine flu scare pandemic that happened, you know, about 10 years ago or so. Um, so... It's really a case of like, I think if you're in your 20s or 30s, you could get coronavirus and not worry about your health at all. You would be fine, assuming you don't vape or anything like that. And then you could go around spreading it, you know? And it's the perfect weapon. It's not dangerous to you, but it's dangerous to other people. And it's most importantly dangerous to the economy as it spreads. You know, if you're a typical guy who's healthy as a horse, you know, and you don't vape and you don't have any risk factors, there's nothing to fear from coronavirus, if you ask me. You know, if it only killed 0.1% of the people who got it, then it would not be a good weapon and be useless to spread to take down the government. And if at a lethal rate of 30 or 40%, even 20%, then it'd be too dangerous to contract and spread. But a 4% lethalness rate is perfect for spreading, especially since it only kills old people, and thus it's safe for a guy in his 20s or 30s to get so that he can spread it. You know, a perfect weapon like coronavirus only comes along once in a long while. This is the perfect opportunity to try to destroy the government. And if our attempt fails, well, we always retain the options of forming a no-go zone or using EXPLOSIVESs to take down buildings in order to topple the government. So we could always still use that option of getting rid of the government. And considering MGTOW men are always talking about toppling the government, but without talking about forming communes or no-go zones, this means that MGTOW men should be in favor of spreading coronavirus, because if they're in favor of a crash in a few decades, then why not be in favor of a crash right now? What's the difference if we have a crash now and they're not prepared, versus having a crash in 30 years when they're not prepared? Most MGTOW men don't believe in prepping or forming their own communes or no-go zones, so they won't be prepared when the crash happens in 30 or 40 years, so why not cause the crash to happen now. It's better to have the crash happen now if you're unprepared rather than the crash happening in 30 or 40 years when you're unprepared. This is because the crash will be much more horrific when it happens in 30 or 40 years because the national debt and unfunded liabilities are only getting bigger. You know, the environmental problems are only getting worse, etc. The crash will be horrific if it happens now, but it will be significantly more horrific if it happens in 20 to 40 years. If MGTOW men don't want to use the coronavirus to destroy the government now, then they're most likely being hypocrites, especially if they don't want to do it because they say that it could cause a horrific collapse. Either MGTOW men should spread coronavirus or they should admit that prepping by forming a no-go zone which sus sustains itself by gardening is very important. Although, to be intellectually honest, I must admit that perhaps MGTOW's strategy is to cause a slow, gradual collapse over 40 years, and, and they hope, perhaps the MGTOWs hope or expect that during the slow collapse, there will be people slowly innovating government out of existence gradually, so the government slowly disappears, and, you know, new things like Silk Road or whatever gradually replace government, and, and over a period of decades, thus leading to a smooth transition from government to whatever replaces government. I'm not saying I think that'll happen, I'm just saying, like, maybe MGTOWs are thinking that'll happen, and so maybe that kind of makes sense. Um, so maybe they're not totally hypocritical, but... I don't know. I, I think a lot of MGTOWs probably are hypocritical on this issue. Um, but I think it's incredibly important for people, especially since they probably haven't even thought it through. So how can you say your position is logical if you've not even thought it through at all, you know? But I think it's incredibly important for people to realize that the bigger government gets and the bigger the debt gets and the more infantilized people become, the more, hor more horrific the crash will be when it happens. The longer the crash takes to happen, the worse it will be when it does happen. The debt is already basically an extinction-level event. I'm not saying we would necessarily definitely go extinct, but basically, it's an extinction-level event. That's how horrific the, the debt already is. That's how huge it is. You know, it, it's incredibly big, and it's only getting bigger. So it's, I don't think anybody can even wrap their, very few people, I think, can even wrap their head around how big $128 trillion in unfunded liabilities is. Coupled with the national debt of $23 trillion, that's over $151 trillion. Like... How, like, most people can't even comprehend how much a trillion is, much less 151 trillion. I mean, like, even a billion is beyond the really, the, the mental grasp of most people. So, like, 
when a number gets big enough, it just becomes meaningless to the mind because you can't wrap your head around how big it is. You see, so this is a really, really bad thing. People have no idea. Most people, probably 99% of people have no idea how big that, that, that really is, 151 trillion, and how much that is an extinction level amount of debt, you know, an omnicidal level amount of debt. So it's better for the country, and it, like I said, it's only getting bigger. So it's better for the country to have a crash now rather than have a crash in 10 or 20 or 40 years. But of course, for individuals who are starting their life and are looking to form a commune, people like Old Man Flappy Nuts, these people will be better off in 20 years than they are now. And so for those individual people, it would be better for them if the crash happened later on because they're prepping for it, right? They're, they're you know, buying silver and they're, they're stockpiling bullets, and probably, and, uh, you know, they, they're looking to join or form a commune. And so if the crash happens after they've already joined or formed a commune and the commune is pretty self-sustainable already and knows how to garden and is doing it all already, then they're going to be well-armed. They're going to be living with other well-armed principal people who have courage. They're going to be gardening and stuff like that to sustain themselves. They'll be way safer than the rest of society, you know, when a crash happens when they're already safe like that and isolated like that especially if they don't live near a big city, but live in a far less densely populated area, like maybe an area outside of a small city or town, not in the small city or town, but outside of it, you know. But even though for certain individual men it would be better for them if the crash happens in 20 years, for the country as a whole, it would be better for the crash to happen this year rather than in 20 years. And regarding taking buildings down with EXPLOSIVES, it's not nearly as good of a way of harming the government as coronavirus. If you get coronavirus and then go around infecting people, then you can't be caught. But if you use you-know-whats to take down buildings, then you can be caught and tried and convicted and executed for doing that. And it would be hard to take down enough buildings to cause a collapse or to take down enough of them to get rid of the government, right? Coronavirus is a far better weapon and an untraceable weapon as well. It's the perfect weapon. I think that people need to seriously consider whether they can afford to let this perfect weapon, this perfect opportunity, go to waste. We need to consider <clears throat> whether this perfect opportunity is so perfect that we are morally obligated to make use of it to wage war against the government. Coronavirus is like nature dropping off a nuclear weapon on our front doorstep with, for free with a little note saying, here you go, make good use of it by setting it off in a place with the most number of people. It'll make the world a better place. With love, nature. Right? Like, that. that's what coronavirus is. It's the perfect weapon. And it's the perfect thing. It's just a gift from God. You know what I'm saying? So we really need to look at it this way and think about it this way. And you may say, oh, well, you know, if we infected ourselves and tried to go around infecting a bunch of people, we wouldn't be able to because everyone's so scared. They're staying at home and they're not coming near you. Even if they, you know, like even if they are out on the streets, they're going to stay 10 feet away from you. And, and I'm like, OK, well, so what? If they're, if they're all staying away from you and you can't spread it, then that means they're all scared and they're all staying at home and all the businesses are going to go out of business and then we'll have an economic collapse. And then even better, we can, you know, use coronavirus to destroy America with, and so that we can take over and get freedom back, balkanize it or overthrow the government or whatever, make things radically better all at once after we overthrow the government, get rid of all the senators, all the congressmen, president, etc. Like after we do that, because of the economic collapse, you know, we can make things better really, really, really quick. Say, hey, there's no laws anymore or there's just a few laws, no rape, no murder, no theft, no fraud. <laughs> That's it. Nothing else. Everything else completely legal. Do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like, if we did that, then things would get radically, radically, radically better. And and like I said, you could do that through economic warfare. And even better, if everybody's staying away from you because they think you might have coronavirus, and maybe you do, and you're trying to spread it, but you can't because everyone's staying away from you, well, then it's like you don't even have to spread it. You don't even have to kill anybody. You know what I mean? You don't even have to be responsible for anybody dying from coronavirus to make it so that, you know, Everybody is, you know, the, the economy is utterly destroyed and then you can take over the country. You see what I'm saying? And if you're worried about the morality of it, then look at it like this. If we allow the government to continue growing the debt, waging, like, uh, worried about the morality of actually infecting people, like, oh my god, I don't want to be responsible for human deaths, right? Like, look at it this way. It, it is moral, because if we allow the government to continue growing the debt, waging endless war, etc., there will be a huge number of deaths anyway due to war and economic collapse and disease and all the other horrible things that go along with the collapse. And those deaths will be far greater in number in the future when the collapse happens, as it inevitably eventually will, as compared to the number of deaths that will happen from coronavirus, or that will happen from the societal collapse that coronavirus could lead to, or, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, if you spread coronavirus like crazy and you are responsible for a bunch of deaths, dozens or 
There are hundreds of deaths, although no one could ever trace it to you, so you'll get away with it. Um, even if you're responsible for thousands of deaths, really, I don't think you're responsible for any deaths, because by doing so, you precipitate a crash. You make a crash happen early, and that will cause there to be way less death than letting the crash happen in 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. And, and then instead of, you know, like 4 million or 10 or 15 or 20 million people dying from coronavirus, we'll have an extinction-level dead event. It'll be, you know horrific, and we'll have like, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 million people die in, in America alone. Probably not 200 million, but you know, I could easily see 50 to 100 million Americans dying in a horrific Great Depression that's like way worse than the Great Depression of the 30s. I could totally see that happening. So what, what do you want to do? Like have, you know, 4 to, you know, 15 million or 4 to 20 million people die today or, you know, th this year and the next year? Or do you want like, you know, 50 to 100 million people to die in 20 or 30 years? You see what I'm saying? So you're actually saving lives by spreading coronavirus, even if you end up being responsible for a bunch of deaths. And so I really think, you know, people need to think about this. But reg regarding this, I, I wasn't even thinking about this because of this episode, but now that I'm thinking about it, this totally ties in with the, the episode of, ma of the magicians that was on the other day. Uh, it was funny, like Marina had like uh, had all her bad personal personality aspects magically suppressed. And so she's like this good person. And Alice is trying to convince her that like, if you don't give us this item, then even more people will die. Because she's like, well, if I give you that item, a bunch of people could die. And Alice is like, if you don't, even more people will die. And then Marina goes, Alice, people don't, friends don't make friends grapple with the trolley problem. <laughs> it was really, really funny. <laughs> but anyway, oh, and by the way, there's another really funny part in like the, the week before that episode, or maybe it's the week before that. Um, the, the librarian, she says, um, she says, uh, they were talking about these guys who steal books or whatever, uh, and pieces of art and stuff. And she, she goes, she's like, uh, not to mention what they could do to the stock market. And then, uh, Alice goes, the stock market. And she goes, yeah, they have a thing about shorting. They think it's hilarious. <laughs> and that was so funny. Oh my God, it was so hilarious. And, and I thought about it and thought about it. I was like, yeah, that really is true. Um, you know, like uh, shorting is hilarious. Like by voting on the side of entropy, on the side of inevitable success, you can make money. You know, it's kind of like, you know, making money for free just by holding gold, especially if you're rich. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like free money. It's just, it's, it's the most hilarious thing ever, you know, but like, I'm going to talk about that in more detail in another video. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that about the, the more detail of like, you know, the stock market and shorting and, and all that um, and, and stuff. But um, yeah, that was really, really funny also. But um, anyway, like I said, like, um, you know, a huge number of deaths will happen anyway due to war and economic disease and all that. So, you know, it's better if we have the collapse happen now. Right? The bigger the debt gets and the more technologically advanced society gets and the bigger government gets, the more top-heavy society becomes, and thus the more destructive the crash will be when it happens. Right? If we had a crash this year, then maybe 30 to 50 million people would end up dying from rioting and starvation and disease. But if we let ourselves lose this opportunity to spread coronavirus and thereby bring about a collapse, then we might have the collapse in 20 years, and then the collapse could cause, you know, 100 million deaths or more. So any deaths you could spread... Any deaths you cause by spreading coronavirus should be seen as lives that are necessary losses that have to be brought about in order to prevent a much greater number of lives from being lost in the future because of a crash happening in the future that would be even more horrific because of them kicking the can down the road and the debt growing even bigger, as it inevitably always does because the debt can never be stopped because we have a debt-based fiat currency which demands that the debt always grow. Always. It can never stop. And so that's really important to understand. Um, so, you know, it may be horrific to have a crash now, but it would be less horrific than having a crash in 20 years. And I doubt you're going to get much of this kind of talk from MGTOW men because these men are idiotic, cowardly, blue pill statists who have not used their brain to think it through. The boomers contribute nothing to society and deserve death for allowing massive growth of tyranny. Coronavirus is the per not just in gynocentric terms, but in all kinds of other terms. I don't even think of, like, gynocentrism as the primary form of tyranny when I'm talking about the massive growth of tyranny. That's that's just sort of like a, I don't want to say minor, but in my mind, it's not even the first kind of tyranny that I object to. Um, it's it's a it's a second level, second tier form of tyranny, but they tolerated that tyranny too. You know, they tolerated the fiat currency and the war and, and, and the overregulation, and they also tolerated the misandric laws and all that. I mean, they tolerated so much tyranny that, like, they totally deserve death, the boomers do. Coronavirus is the perfect weapon, and such a weapon rarely rarely comes along. It's safer to have the horrific crash happen today than in 20, 10, 20 or 30 years. People in society are too, too infantilized, and thus they need something like coronavirus to wake them up to the reality of death. A, rea a reality which they need to accept, instead of relying on government to protect them from it. 
right? Like there's no hiding from death. I mean, you can think that you can hide from death and, you know, farm out, all, give all your freedoms to government in order to save you from death, but it's not going to save you. Nothing can save you from death. Everybody dies. So just accept it and stop giving up your freedom so that you can live, you know, because the government's not going to be able to save you anyway. It's totally incompetent and psychotic. And the coward and society is too cowardly and weak, and thus coronavirus is needed to strengthen the gene pool too, because our gene pool has been getting more and more sickly ever since we created antibiotics. It's been getting worse and worse and worse as all the sickly people can survive and breed. So we need to strengthen the gene pool, and coronavirus is good for that too. You know, killing off all the sickly and the old and the immoral, like the the regular vapors, people who vape too much. Okay, they they're they're interested in getting high all day. Fuck them. You know, they're not moral. Let them die. I don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, the coronavirus will kill off all the sickly and the old and, and only let the normal healthy people with decent genes survive, and that's good. It'll mean less sickly people in the future, and that's good for the, the next generation. Sick people die, and it's good for the healthcare system, too. Less burden on the healthcare system. Less financial burden, you know? Sick people die young anyway, so why pour tons of money into trying to give them a few more years of life? You know, like if you had a child with cancer and the child only had a, you know, 3% chance of survival and the treatment would cost all your savings and to make it so you could not send any of your other kids to college, all of whom are healthy, does it make sense to try to save the life of your child who has bad genes and thereby ruin the futures of all your other children? Or is it better to accept the reality of death and thereby preserve the financial futures of the rest of your kids so that they won't be doomed to poverty because of not having gotten any kind of a head start in life because of their parents wasting all the money on trying to, you know, this 3% chance of survival to save their kid with cancer. Or, or if you still think that, oh yeah, I'd still do it with the kid with cancer, I'd still try to save them even though it's a 3% chance, then I'll say, okay, what if this chance of survival is 2%? What if it was 1%? What if it was 0.1%? What if it was 0.01% of saving your child with cancer with this particular treatment? Would you then spend all your savings on it and doom all your other kids to much less successful futures because of not being able to go to college or start a business or, or have a house, you know, down payment or whatever? Like, really? Like, at some point, it becomes untenable to waste that much money on a child with that low of a chance of survival. You know what I'm saying? So you eventually have to make that choice. Even if you think 3% is high enough to risk it, well, I'm sure you think that 0.001% is not high enough chance to risk, you know, wasting all your savings on such a tiny chance of saving your kid with cancer. You see what I'm saying? So, like, there's no point in, in you know, being ridiculous and wasting money on stuff that is just probably not worth it, right? Either you only get a tiny benefit out of it that's not worth it, or the chances of getting a big benefit out of it are so tiny that it's not worth even trying. You see, it's like, accept the reality of death and life will be better. This country needs to accept the reality of death. It's like, our country, uh, simultaneously, paradoxically, seemingly, seemingly paradoxically, not actually paradoxically, but seemingly paradoxically, our country accepts the, doesn't accept the reality of death, but at the same time, we totally, like, ignore the reality. I guess it's sort of actually the same thing. We ignore the reality of death in ourselves, and we also ignore the reality of the death of the innocent people that are getting killed by our government overseas, like in Iraq, right? So this is, or Afghanistan. It's, this is how it is. Like, callousness and denial of reality kind of actually go together, right? So this is how it is, right? Um, I, I think the answer is clear that, you know, wasting a huge amount of money on sick people with little or no chance of survival is, is a terrible idea. It's far better to spend that money on productive purposes. And this applies to coronavirus. You know, it, it applies to kids with cancer. It applies to old people, you know, and the risk of them getting coronavirus. It's a principle that applies to everything, actually. Money should be used where it will do the most good, not on causes where it will do little good. And saving worthless lives is not to be considered doing good. Doing good is saving lives that can actually accomplish some good for the world. Now, if the baby boomers actually had a lot of wisdom and a very high moral standard, then even though they're really old, like in their 60s or early 70s, I would say, yeah, let's save them. As long as we don't have to, um, you know, take away our freedoms to do so. Like, don't take anybody's freedoms away, but like, you know, maybe spend some money on developing vaccine and save the boomers. Because they're very wise and they have a high moral standard and they're useful to society because of being a good moral example and stuff, right? I would say save them, but they don't have good morals not like their grandfathers and grandmothers did. So I say the boomers are not moral enough to be saved. So, you know, just leave them alone, man. Don't let the government do anything about coronavirus. Just let it do its thing. Let it purify the gene pool. Coronavirus is a gift from nature, and we need to start seeing it that way. It's a gift, which will make us physically and emotionally tougher. It's just too bad that Trump has little wisdom. If Trump had wisdom, he would see coronavirus for the gift that it is, a gift that we should not try to stop. But of course, even if Trump had this wisdom, he would be forced to deal with coronavirus because he has not been re-elected yet. 
You know, he would certainly lose his run for re-election if he did, not, did nothing about the coronavirus. This is the problem with politicians. They always cave to the public pressure, the political pressure. Alan Greenspan knew that you should leave the economy alone and let everything sort itself out naturally. He's very much like a, he was or is very much a gold advocate, right? But he lost his principles or didn't act according to his principles. Uh, he still seems to believe similarly, as he believed before, although now he seems to maybe not be quite so outspoken about it, or at the very least, he, he didn't act out as how he believed when he was the Federal Reserve Chairman. But, you know, he knew that you should leave the economy alone. That was his philosophy, right? But then when it came down to it, and there was, you know, a little crash that started, and it came time to let the crash happen, he, he caved, and then he tried to fix the economy instead of allowing it to fix itself by allowing the crash to happen, which would have forced the government to shrink, forced everybody to go back to sound money, forced, you know, society to become more moral, and then, and then would have prevented all the future crashes, right? But, you know, he didn't do that. He caved to the political pressure, probably from the president at the time, and then he, you know, quote-unquote, fixed the economy by lowering interest rates to artificially stimulate growth, which then just locked us into a pattern of, you know, having to keep interest rates low, and then and then enabled, that enabled the U.S. to keep spending insane amounts of money, growing the debt way bigger than we ever could have before, because eventually the interest paying on the debt is so big that all you can do is pay the interest. You can't even pay the debt down anymore. And when that becomes the case, then you really have to stop spending money, you see? So he could have allowed that to happen, but he didn't. He lowered interest rates so the U.S. could keep growing its debt because now it has to pay less in interest. And if if interest rates are negative, the U.S. can even um, either, what, what would it be? Like, yeah, the U.S. I think would either be not having, it would have to pay less interest or maybe no interest um, on the debt. I think, yeah, I think then he, the U.S. would be getting paid to, to have a huge debt. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking on the fly here. I'm not great at thinking on the fly, especially since I'm a slow thinker. I'm very precise and logical and, and uh, creative, but I think very slowly. So I can't really, you know, get it for you quickly here, whether that would be really the case. Sometimes you need to spend an hour or two thinking things through, like like what, how I did so that I figured out that, you know, uh, MGTOW promiscuity causes gynocentrism. I had to think that out in detail over a long time. It took, I think, a two-hour you know, talking to my video recorder, going over every possibility in the mathematics of it, and then I figured it out because um, I'm not great at math and because I'm a slow thinker. But anyway, um, yeah, he could have, you know, saved everything. But yeah, I think you would actually get paid to, the U.S. would get paid to hold its debt instead of having to pay interest. It would be getting paid interest by other companies, I mean other countries, um, if, you know, we had negative interest rates. But even just having super, super low interest rates, like, you know, 0.1% interest rate or something, made us have to pay barely any interest on our massive, massive debt. And so that just allowed us to grow the debt even more, because it's almost like, at, at that point, the debt can be almost infinitely huge, and, and you pay barely any in interest, you know? So pay barely any dollars, because the interest is so low, you know what I mean? So, you know, he could have allowed the economy to fix itself, but no, he came to the political pressure, and he, he tried to fix the economy by, you know, sustaining, by kicking the can down the road. You know, he lowered interest rates, so it led to the cycle of interest rates getting lower and lower, and not being able to be brought right back up to normal levels, and that eventually led to the 2008 crash. And then they reinflated the bubble again, you know, <laughs> and they tried, or they tried to, not very successfully. That that bubble reinflation, that economic bubble reinflation was not nearly as successful as as Greenspan's was, because every time you kick the can, you can't kick it as far as, la as the last time you could. So then you can kick the can for, you know, shorter and shorter and shorter distance every time you kick it, and then eventually you have a massive horrific crash when you can't kick it anymore, you know? And there's been massive poverty and suffering as a result of the government and the Federal Reserve's refusal to allow the economy to fix itself. But of course allowing the economy to fix itself would make the U.S.'s debt unpayable, like I said, without massive money printing of the type that would cause hyperinflation and a sell-off of U.S. debt by other, other countries. Now, of course, such a thing would be a good thing in the long term, but the short term pain would be extreme. And people, especially government, are like drug addicts. They don't want the temporary pain of withdrawal, of doing the right thing, of, of you know, paying their comeuppance rather than get, letting it get lethal. You know, like, so lethal that is like the debt being lethal to the economy. So they don't want the temporary pain of withdrawal to get healthy again. So they're going to do anything they can to get their heroin or cocaine rather than go through withdrawal. Even though after the withdrawal, they'd be clean and then they'd be way happier and then they wouldn't need to use the drug at all, right? So it's way better to get clean. But, you know, governments don't want to get clean. They want to keep on racking up more and more debt, just like a drug addict. Same thing, you know, governments don't want to go through the withdrawal of an economic crash or a hyperinflation to fix the economy. They, they just want to keep pretending everything's okay and getting the debt bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Just like they don't, just like the country doesn't want to go through the healing, purifying, toughening process that coronavirus offers us the opportunity to experience. And so we're trying to stop it instead of embracing it and preparing for it by eating healthy and exercising so that we contract, so that when we contract coronavirus, we stand a better chance of surviving. And besides, if coronavirus took out a bunch of the fat people, that would be good too, wouldn't it? I mean, these fat people, even if you could say, oh, well, it's their genes. You know, a lot of thin people overeat too. They just don't put on weight because they have different genes. Okay. Well, I'm not saying those people deserve to live either. I'm just saying like the, the fat people, uh, yeah, maybe in a sense those genes are good. But in another sense, it's like these are people who, despite their good genes, don't have the discipline to eat healthy and a limited amount of food anyway. So their lack of discipline is either a function of their bad upbringing, in which case it's not their fault, really, but or maybe it's a function of genetics, because I think morality is 50%, you know, genetic. So if it's a chance, if it's a genetic thing, why they have no self-control and are thus huge, three, four hundred pounds or whatever, or five hundred pounds, well then, you know, those are good genes to get out of the populace by allowing coronavirus to take out those fat people. Because you don't want people with the genes for no self-control in the populace. That's a bad thing. It goes along with other forms of immorality. You know, like lying. A lot of fat people lie a lot. And that's why they, you know, like if you put them on a diet or something and the doctor, the doctor puts them on a diet, they'll, the do they'll go to the doctor, you know, after a month or two and he'll see if they lost weight. And if they haven't, or if they've gained weight, then he'll be like, well, have you been following the diet? And they'll say, yes, I've been following the diet. They'll swear up and down they've been following the diet, even though they're totally lying. And they've been not following the diet, which is why they gained the weight, you know? <clears throat> so yeah, you know, even taking out a bunch of fat people would be a good thing if coronavirus did that. Because you, you need the genes for discipline and morality in society. Having the genes for undisciplinedness, lack of discipline genes, and, and immorality genes, whether it's you know psychopathy or sadism or anything else, these genes need to be taken out of the populace. And the fact that tyranny will probably be worse after the coronavirus, if we spread the coronavirus as a way of waging war against the government, that fact that a worse coronavirus epidemic will make the government respond with a lot more tyranny than they would have done if the epidemic had been less bad, this increased tyranny is not even really a reason to not spread coronavirus because the tyranny is going to increase as time goes by anyway. Tyranny is like entropy. It always increases unless you fight it. Actually, tyranny is non-functional and slows down technological progress. So actually, tyranny is a manifestation of entropy. And so since without revolutionary war or people forming a no-go zone or lots more people becoming subversive coders like Zeitgeist Eater, the result will be that tyranny will always naturally increase anyway. This means that any increase in tyranny that results from a failed effort to take down the government by spreading coronavirus, such an increase in tyranny is not a reason to not spread coronavirus because tyranny will happen anyway. So we can't let fear of increased tyranny as a result of a failure to take down the government by coronavirus, spreading coronavirus. We can't let that fear stop us from spreading coronavirus because tyranny will increase anyway, even if we do nothing. Even if we cooperate and do everything the government wants, tyranny will still increase, you know? Just like, you know, if you do whatever the bully wants, he's going to keep stealing your lunch money. He'll probably steal more if you're cooperative. You know what I mean? So, so just going along with the government is not the answer. Whether we cooperate with the government or make the government stronger by fighting it, by spreading coronavirus, and us failing to take down the government that way, in either case, tyranny will increase. And so we need to fight government, because by capitulating to government, we stand no chance of defeating it. You know, government will just get... You know, the government will get so big and collapse on a, on a scale that it causes human extinction if we don't fight the government. But at least by fighting the government, we stand a chance of, uh, you know, a, a chance of regaining freedom, right? There's at least a chance. As well as, you know, maybe if we do succeed at getting rid of the government, we have a good chance of getting peace, prosperity, happiness, virtue, and fast technological progress that results from having freedom. We have a good chance of getting all that back. Not guaranteed, because if we get a dictator or an even worse government afterward... You know, that, that'll, that'll be no good. We won't have all those advantages. But if we do have an ANCAP or a libertarian, you know, uh, government after we overthrow the government, then, yeah, prosperity and peace and happiness and virtue will return. And fast technological progress, too. And all the higher standard of living that comes with fast technological progress, especially when those increases in standard of living are not being siphoned off by excessive taxation, which you would not have. You would not have excessive taxation under a new libertarian or, an, you know, government or an ANCAP, you know, country. And if you think the coronavirus stands no chance of destroying the government, you're gravely mistaken. The U.S. economy, the US economy is incredibly fragile due to all the welfare, all the endless wars, 
you know, foreign wars like Iraq and Afghanistan, all the overregulation on Americans, you know, there's no freedom, all the Federal Reserve monetary shenanigans and keeping interest rates insanely low for such an insanely long time, etc., etc. Coronavirus can be used as just the first domino in a series of dominoes where every domino is larger than the previous domino. This is a real thing. Each domino can knock over a domino, something like 50% larger or heavier or something like that. So then you can have each domino be bigger than the last, and then the first domino can be tiny, and yet without, and yet with enough dominoes of ascending size, with enough of them, the last domino can be absolutely gargantuan, you know, absolutely huge. Coronavirus could harm the economy, and then that could easily force the Federal Reserve to respond in a way that causes even more damage. You know, the, the coronavirus is the first domino, and then it knocks over the Federal Reserve domino, which, you know, the Federal Reserve does stupid stuff, which causes more unemployment, which is the third domino, which creates more distrust in the dollar, which is the fourth domino, as the U.S. government prints up a bunch of money to give to people who are unemployed. And then, you know, the fifth domino or the sixth domino is more foreigners dumping U.S. dollars. This, this could easily snowball and lead to a hyperinflation, and hyperinflation could easily lead to civil or revolutionary war. It's not a crazy scenario at all. It's so possible that Tucker Carlson even mentioned it on his show the other day on Monday. <clears throat> he talked about coronavirus and Fed policy and America turning into Zimbabwe a country famous for having had a massive hyperinflation. I think they had two, actually two hyperinflations in a pretty short period of time because they had the same ruler, the same president uh, under both those hyperinflations. And he, he was stupid and he wanted to print a bunch of money, you know? So hence hyperinflation. You know, hyperinflations are a common thing in history all around the world, not just Zimbabwe. Historically speaking, fiat currency is a notorious failure. In just the 20th century alone, there were a lot of hyperinflations all over the world. All through the 1900s, hyperinflation here, hyperinflation there, another five years later, another hyperinflation in this part of the world, another hyperinflation, another five or ten years later in this other, you know, country. I mean, just, there were so many, I can't remember if there's 20 or 50 or 100, there were a bunch of hyperinflations in just the 1900s alone. I mean, hyperinflations are a common, common thing. You know, we, we just forget that because it's been so long since we've had one. You know, it was the 70s since we had even any any significant inflation, and that wasn't even a hyperinflation, wasn't even close to hyperinflation. So it's been so long that we forget that hyperinflations are, are common and inevitable, you know? Um, so, you know, one good, one good thing about a, good, a huge collapse in America would mean that the economies of the world would collapse too, because they're all incredibly interconnected. The whole entire world economy almost went down in the late 1990s, like 1999, or maybe it was 2000 or 2001. Jim Rickards talked about it. He was involved in dealing with the crisis and preventing it from turning into a worldwide economic collapse. And then the same thing happened again in 2008, but even worse. And then, you know, the government had to bail out the world even more so that time. Uh, but the cost of doing so was much steeper in 2008 when they did it. And we're still paying a heavy price for what they did then. Things have still not gotten back to normal because the government refuses to let it get back to normal because it would cause a lot of pain. We'd have to go through a lot of short-term pain to let things get back to normal, but they don't want to do that because they're short-sighted. You know, the government would have to shrink, and the government absolutely refuses to do the same necessary thing. That is, repeal most of the laws and shrink the size of the government by 90 to 95 per, 90, 90 to 99%. Government refuses to do that, and so our economy stays fucked up. But my point is that the economies of the world are all incredibly interconnected, and if one of them goes down, especially a big country like America or China, then it is guaranteed to take down the economies of every other country in the world. This fragility is caused by government's very existence, by government's wastefulness and incompetence and greed and vice-like control of everything. You know, they have just a vice-like grip on everything, and they refuse to let go. You know, this kind of economic fragility would not exist under anarcho-capitalism. This kind of economic fragility would not exist under anarcho-capitalism because there would not, not be this vice-like control of everything. There would be a, a chaotic but free and peaceful, you know, ev evolving free market. And there would also be sound money. Everyone would be way richer. Way more people would be gardening. You know, people would be free to garden in their front yard instead of there being regulations against it. You know, not by government necessarily, but by, you know, the city or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it, this economic fragility that exists now would not exist under ANCAP. It just wouldn't. But since it does exist now, this means that if we crash the U.S.'s economy, every economy in the world will go down. And this will mean that while we're overthrowing our own government, or while we're founding our own country in the chaos of the U.S., trying to recover from a huge depression bigger than the Great Depression of the 30s, the governments of the rest of the world will be too busy dealing with their own problems to try to cause problems for a new libertarian or anarcho-capitalist America that arises from the ashes of the old America. You know, China and other countries are not going to invade. They're going to be too busy trying to keep their own people from overthrowing them. 
you know, in creating their own new government in their country, right? They won't have the time or the money to send troops to America to invade and conquer America when our government goes down. So that's another advantage of taking down the world economy by taking down the American economy by spreading coronavirus. And if the libertarians and the ANCAPs all choose to form their own country within America, then America will be too busy worrying about its own problems to try to send the U.S. military in to that no-go zone or, or that, you know, gigantic commune or, or new country that's been declared within America or whatever you want to call it, you know, by ANCAPs and or libertarians. So then the no-go zone would grow very prosperous and powerful because the government would be leaving it alone. The U.S. government would be leaving it alone because the U.S. government would be trying to keep everybody else, uh, everywhere else in the country, you know, under control. You know, stop the rioting and everything else, right? Stop the coups and the, and the attempted revolutions and the civil war and all the rest of it, right? Where all the ANCAPs are just huddled together and are gardening and keeping everybody else out with their guns and everything. And they're, and they're declaring themselves to be a, a new country or whatever. And the U.S. government wouldn't be able to do jack shit about it because they, they have their hands full, you know? They, they, the U.S. And then by the time the U.S. government has recovered enough to attack the no-go zone, the libertarians ANCAP no-go zone will be too powerful to attack and will then basically have already become its own country. This pandemic is going to restrict our right to travel. This is another thing you need to understand. It's almost certainly going to lead to a massive increase in tyranny, just like 9-11 did. It's foolish to not believe this. And they'll be way more prepared to restrict people's movements when the next pandemic hits. More uh, systemically prepared, I mean. You know, they'll have put, you know, protocols in place and all this kind of stuff. Maybe even new laws. And, and it's also probably humane to spread coronavirus as well for yet another reason. And that reason is that coronavirus could mutate and become more lethal. And if it does, I'm not a doctor, not scientifically educated at all, but I think that if you got a, a, the first coronavirus and you recovered from it, then if coronavirus mutates and then you get the second coronavirus, you'll probably be, have a lot better chance of surviving that second stronger coronavirus than if you had never gotten the first coronavirus and recovered from it. Um, I could be wrong. I don't really know much about medicine or anything, but like, I think that's the way it works, right? <clears throat> You know, don't jump down my throat if I'm wrong, but I think that's the way it works. And if so, then it is good to get as many people infected as possible, because then everybody who survives will be safe or way safer if coronavirus mutates and becomes even more dangerous and stronger, right? Uh, like I said, you know, the, so if, if we let people hole up in their houses and they never get coronavirus and then it, and then it mutates, it's going to kill way, way, way more people. You know, far better to have them get it now and so that it, when it mutates, it's not going to kill as many people. You know, venereal diseases have evolved and gotten stronger. You know, gonorrhea, there's strains which are now incurable. You know, there are other diseases which have gotten stronger as well. That's what, that's what they do. There's evo that's evolution. You know, diseases evolve too. So, you know, we have to allow ourselves to evolve, to evolve as well. And by coddling everybody, by trying to give everybody a, a vaccine or, or like, you know, keep everybody in their houses so they never even get exposed to coronavirus, this is not allowing yourself to evolve. And so then you just keep yourself weak. So then the viruses are evolving, but you're not evolving. And, and so this means that, you know, things are just going to get worse and worse and you're in more danger, the species is, right? Especially since, you know, we don't know which viruses are going to mutate and become way more lethal. Remember when swine flu happened? Everyone was like, we don't know how dangerous this is or, or how dangerous it could become. You know, they're acting like it could, you know, maybe kill everybody, right? Like, and who knows, maybe one of these diseases will mutate and start killing 99% of people, right? But it probably better... If everybody's contracted it or other diseases, I mean, like other viruses before that, like swine flu and stuff, so that everybody has as strong of an immune system as possible, so that everybody has the best chance to survive this really deadly mutated virus as they as possible, you know? Better to have as many people catch it, uh, you know, swine flu or coronavirus or whatever, um, when it's not as dangerous. You know, that way the weak will die and the strong will get stronger, right? And then they'll be able to survive the next pandemic, which might be a, might be the big one, you know, the plague, which kills 50 or 99% of the population. You know, you net 50% or 99% of the population, you, know, you never know. So the only humane thing to do, the only smart thing to do, is to strengthen everybody as much as possible by having everybody get these viruses so that everybody gets stronger and more prepared for the coming big pandemic, which if we're all prepared from, for might not be nearly as bad. Maybe maybe it's a virus that would have killed 99% of the population, but because we all allowed ourselves to get infected by with these viruses that were that were relatively harmless earlier, you know, over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years before that, then when the then the really deadly one comes along, instead of killing 99% of the population, it might only kill 50% of the population. And there's a big difference between killing off 99% of the population or killing off 50% of the population. You see what I'm saying? And we and, and plus, like all the people that would die 
from, you know, uh, spreading coronavirus and stuff, just, you know, 10, 15, 20 million people or whatever, that is way less people than would die if 99% if of the population dies under the next pandemic rather than 50%. You see what I'm saying? So, like, you're saving lives that way, too, by spreading coronavirus. And we allow ourselves to mentally and emotionally toughen up, like I said before, and stop freaking out about things like coronavirus. If we do that, then we'll be able to demand and thus have more freedom. And then being more prosperous due to having more freedom will mean that fewer people will die from preventable causes, which are not ca which are caused by other things, not coronavirus, but like, you know, which are caused by things like not having enough money these days. You know, like a lot of people die from health care because they're not being able to afford health care or they have a, a serious or like a minor health problem turned into a really serious one that can't be put, totally cured now anymore because they couldn't afford health care when it would have been cheap to fix them, you know? The answer is not to have universal health care because that's paid for by government and government pays for it with your tax dollars. So, you know, your government's just taking your money and then you're the one paying for the health care anyway. And the government doesn't give you it all back. It gives you back, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent of what it stole from you. So that it's way more inefficient, you know, than just letting the people keep the dollars in their pockets. You know, or the government is taking more money from people who are richer than you to do universal health care. And then there's and then that's stealing. You know, they're, they're, it's paying for the health care for the middle and lower classes by stealing it from rich people. And that's theft. That's no good. You know, let's have a fair society, right? I'm, I'm not against there being rich people. I'm against rich people getting rich unfairly and, and having an unfair advantage and using their money for evil. That's what I'm against. I'm not against there being people who have more money than other people. I'm not some kind of, you know, fanatical egalitarian or something. I'm not a communist. You know, so like I said, you know, that's stealing, you know, to give people health care. If you take it from the rich and give it to the poor, that's no good. You know, that's only justifiable if the rich stole the money, which I guess they did these days. But it's still not a good reason to make government bigger by allowing it to steal money from rich people to give it to poor people. You know, it's like, you know, universal health care is a retarded idea. It's absolutely retarded. You know, we just need to leave the money in the hands of the people. It's all we have to do. You know, then everybody can pay for the health care that they need as they need it without having to have a lot of it wasted by government and without having to steal from rich people. Universal health care is no solution at all. Government is never the solution to any problem. The solution is to stop being cowards and toughen up. That way, not toughen up physically like your immune system. I'm talking like psychologically toughen up. You know, that way we can stop wasting money on government, trying to fix every little problem, and we can instead keep way more money in our pockets and can thus be able to afford health care so fewer of us die. Having big government may, I repeat, may be able to deal with things like coronavirus, but big government costs a ton of money, and so because of all the wars and the loss of life, because of being unable to afford health care as well, and other forms of loss of life, um, having big government means an overall loss of life, even though the government may occasionally save lives, such as how it's trying to save people from coronavirus. But of course, having big government doesn't just mean saving lives from coronavirus while losing them to poverty caused by taxation and inflation. It also means having less freedom, and even if the number of lives that the government saved is as large as the number of lives that's responsible for taking, whether it takes those lives directly through war or indirectly through taxation and inflation, it's still the case that we should not have government because the loss of freedom is the deciding factor. Loss of freedom is a bad thing, and if the lives lost are awash, if they even out, you're still locked down by lots of bullshit laws. And if you're a moral person, then, you're, uh, then you are unnecessarily locked down. Because if you're a moral person, you don't need laws to restrict your behavior. You're naturally restraining yourself. You don't need laws to tell you not to rape. You're naturally going to avoid raping. You don't need laws to tell you not to steal. You're going to naturally not steal. So, you know, laws are unnecessary for the moral person, you know? And government's laws are usually stupid and counterproductive anyway, like outlawing marijuana. So there's no reason to have government. Everyone would be way better off if they were either a tiny government or no government. The poor would be infinitely better off, the middle class would be better off, and even the rich would be better off. Not just from more advanced technology, but also from being richer. If there were no government, then everyone would be richer because everyone would be keeping all the money that they earn instead of losing lots of one's money to property tax, income tax, sales tax, tickets, paying for a driver's license, and all the other crap the government charges you for. Government is a parasite that feeds on everyone. From the homeless person on the street to the billionaire in his mansion, everyone is made poorer and more restricted by government. The good people are restricted from doing what is harmless, like eating a cannabis edible. The bad people are restricted from doing bad things, at least officially, but the rich bad people get away with their crimes anyway. So they do get to do bad things. So even though it's illegal, they still get to do bad things. So considering the rich people are usually, you know, psychos, uh, there's a disproportionate number of psychos at the top of the power pyramid because they're, they're stingy. They, they're willing to steal, even if it's only legally. And, and they're, they're, they're stingy, so they never lose money, so they get a big financial advantage over time. 
Especially since, you know, if their parent gets rich because of being stingy, then he passes the money on to his kid, then his kid gets a big head start, and then he gets even richer by being stingy, and then soon, you know, the whole family's really rich, right? So rich people are typically stingy, and not just stingy, they're psychos, and that's why they're stingy. So, you know, considering the people that under statism really do need to be restrained, the people who don't have morals, those are the very people who are often rich, and thus they can get away with their crimes because they're rich, even though their crimes are against the law. So there's no point in having the law whatsoever. You know, because it's a two-tier justice system and everybody else is moral, so there's no need for laws put, you know, against them, right? And, and the rich people have an army of lawyers to defend them and stuff. And the good, like, like I said, the good people are restri restricted from doing bad things, which they would never do anyway. And thus those laws are unnecessary. And the bad people are uninterested in doing good things. And the government does not require them to do good things, like give to charity. So the government is useless in that respect as well. And regarding the whole thing about them saying the coronavirus affects the young people too, they want to scare the young people into staying off the streets. No, 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 no. Fuck that. Fear is not the way forward. We've had enough fear. We've been cowards for the last 50 to 100 years, especially for the last, you know, 30 years, maybe 40 years. And the result has been utterly horrific. You know, draw the line wherever you wish. You know, we're, we've been even more especially cowards for the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. The cowardice just gets more and more extreme as time goes by. Everyone's always so Darwinian these days. Everyone is super callous these days, at least in America. And so these days, people that better not dare accuse me of being a psychopath, when these are the people who are totally apathetic about horrific wars like the war in Iraq, which killed one to two million people. Million! Most Americans are callous, hypocritical idiots, and these people don't deserve to continue existing on this planet. You know, if elderly so-called conservatives who didn't have the balls to advocate for revolutionary war, and if liberals and if fat people and if people who vape and if sickly people and if other kinds of deplorables die as a result of the coronavirus, then I got to say, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. And remember, the more sick people we have, and the more sick people we save, people who would have otherwise died from a pitifully weak little virus like coronavirus, most of those people you save, they're going to go on to breed and they're going to pass on their unhealthy genes. And so you won't just be paying to save those people, you'll be paying in the future to take care of their sickly children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way down through history until we genetically engineer sickness out of people. You know, you won't just have to save their kids and grandkids and great-grandkids from the next thing like coronavirus. You'll have to pay for all the other kinds of health expenses that those sickly descendants will require. Will re require. Imagine all the massive amounts of wealth that will be wasted by taking care of all those people. You know, not just the people who survived coronavirus today uh, because of, you know, being kept away from it or, or being, you know, given a cure rather than, you know, just letting their immune system handle it if they can or not. You know, imagine how much cheaper healthcare would be if hardly anyone ever got sick. Like if we let coronavirus and all the other things take out all the sickly people, that would make it so that, you know, everybody would be way more healthy. And then, and then it'd be the case that like, you know, healthcare would be super cheap. Because, you know, it'd be a situation where, you know, most people don't even need health care. You know, the, most people don't need to see the doctor, not very often, right? So then the country would be way richer and there'd be way less of a burden. Like, you know, like I can't get in to see the doctor soon enough or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it would just be way, way better if everybody were healthier, right? Um, but of course, then universal health care would not be necessary if... Like, we could, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say, right? Like, uh, it would even be, like, make it possible to have universal health care uh, because the country could afford it due to everyone being incredibly healthy and rarely needing to see a doctor. But then again, if everyone were super healthy like that, then universal health care would be uh, viable but unnecessary because everybody would be so so prosperous, you know, <laughs> that it would be a situation of, like, you know, uh, health care costs would also be incredibly low, and, and so the poor would easily be able to afford to see the doctor and buy medicines if they got sick, which most people wouldn't. So then it's like, considering healthcare would be affordable, why would you even need to have, you know, universal healthcare at all? But, you know, if they couldn't, not much would need to be stolen by taxation to pay for a universal healthcare system. But of course, government would rob the system and make it bloated and inefficient, and so it would be much better to have poor people in a super healthy society have their healthcare costs paid by charities. And everyone would have more money from not spending money on healthcare because of being so healthy, and thus they'd have more money to donate to charity, and thus those charities would easily be able to afford to take care of all the poor people who occasionally need to see the doctor and pay for medications, but can't afford to do either. The hospitals themselves might be able to absorb the costs. You know, they already do, but if everyone was super healthy, then there'd be few sick people seeing the doctor and not being able to pay, and thus there'd be few such costs for the hospital to absorb. And on top of all the other reasons I gave as to why sick people should be allowed to get coronavirus and die if they have bad enough genes to be killed by it so that they don't have descent and so that they don't have descendants, another reason that they should be allowed to die and not have descendants is that it's very inhumane to allow those descendants of sickly people to be born. 
It's inhumane to the sickly people themselves. You know, it'd be very pleasant, sorry, it'd be very unpleasant for them to have to live lives where they're getting sick all the time, right? That's no good. That's not humane. Like Socrates, I think it was Socrates said, the greatest boon may never have been being born, may have been, may be to never have been born at all. The greatest boon may be never having been born at all, right? That's what he said. Let's, so let's give all those sickly descendants the boon, the gift of not being able, of not being born in the first place by, you know, allowing their ancestor to die. That is today's sickly person to die from coronavirus. Um, in the book At Our Wits End, the authors Edward Dutton and Michael A. Woodley talk about how the death penalty was for hundreds of years killing the dumbest people. Being dumb, they would commit crimes, then they'd be executed. But yet the upper class people who committed crimes could plead benefit of the clergy and avoid execution by proving that they could read by but that they could read by reading a passage from the Bible, and then that um, enabled them to not be executed, because that was the law. So the dumb criminals were getting killed by execution, and the smart, educated criminals were not getting executed. So this had a eugenic effect, and it caused average IQs to get higher and higher. And the same thing is true of things like coronavirus and health. Coronavirus is like executing criminals. Criminals are usually lower in IQ. If you let things like swine flu and coronavirus take out the sickly people, then people will get healthier and healthier generation after generation. But if you use medicine to save sickly people, then you're allowing less healthy people to pass on their genes when they regularly would not, you know, when, when they otherwise would not. Maybe this is good in terms of preserving more genetic diversity and more high IQ genes, but in other terms, such as, you know, health terms, it's a bad thing that we use medicine to save people. We would all be way healthier if medicine had never been invented because evolution would have weeded out the unhealthy genes until everyone were way healthier than they were. You know, if we had had, like, no medicine over the last 200 years, we'd be even healthier, like, even healthier than we were 200 years ago because all the sickly people would keep dying out more and more and more and more, and then the healthy people would just get healthier and healthier and healthier until everyone is just incredibly healthy, right? But I shouldn't even be surprised that we're doing the dysgenic thing of trying to treat the coronavirus instead of letting everyone get it or not get it by staying home, like in the case of old people. I mean, almost everything else we're doing is insane and dysgenic, so why should this be any different, especially since the public is so stupid as to think that we should allow government to deal with problems instead of leaving people themselves and the corporations to deal with these problems? You know, anyone with any common sense knows how utterly incompetent the government is. Uh, government is utterly incompetent, and everybody with any common sense knows this. Vietnam is proof of government's incompetence. Hurricane Katrina is proof of government's incompetence. 9-11 is more proof. The government was warned beforehand, I think it was months beforehand, and was warned again, even more specifically, weeks beforehand, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, that there was going to be a strike against buildings using airplanes as weapons. They knew the specifics like that. I mean, not who was going to do it or which day, but, like, they knew that airplanes were going to be used as weapons against, like, towers. They knew that. And yet, you know, still the towers fell. Why? Well, there's only two answers. Either the government was utterly incompetent, or the government was in on the plot, and it was a planned event so that America would have an excuse to invade the Middle East, to put Iraq back on the petrodollar, and put Iran on the petrodollar as well. I don't know if Iran has ever been on the petrodollar, but if they were, it was probably a long time ago. So, you know, they want they wanted to rack back on the petrodollar because three years earlier, uh, or two years earlier, whenever, um, uh, I think in 2001, um, what's his name? No, no, I think it was 2003, um, Saddam took his country off the petrodollar, and then they went in, in Iraq. Or maybe it's 2001 when he took his country off the petrodollar. But the point is, the, the Iraq had been off the petrodollar for a little while. And then America was like, no, 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 fuck this. We we want Iraq back on the petrodollar. So that's why we invaded. That was the main reason, to put Iraq back on the petrodollar. We did it, I think, within weeks of invading. And Iran, we really want Iran back on the petrodollar. We want Iran on the petrodollar, too. So that's why we're always, you know, for warmongering about, like, you know, how we got to go into Iran. Iran's such a terrible enemy and blah, 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 you know? The government's programs, which worsened and extended the Great Depression, are yet more proof of government's incompetence. China's ghost cities are proof of government being inherently incompetent. Government is always incompetent, basically, unless it's run by a dictator, like, you know, the guy in Germany whose name started with an H. You know, like, he was competent. He was very competent, not totally competent, but, you know, he was quite competent. Compared to most governments, he was incredibly competent. Um, even though they always point out that, you know, the stupid things he did here and there. But yeah, he's, he's one man. How could he be perfect? You know what I mean? Like, compared to the U.S. government's idiocy, I mean, uh, that guy in, in Germany whose name starts with an H, you know who I'm talking about, he, he was like, you know, Buddha compared to, like, you know, <laughs> Idi Amin. 
you know, in his wisdom compared to the U.S. government's wisdom. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah, you occasionally get a competent government when you have a, a king or an emperor or a fuhrer or somebody who has, you know, a lot of wisdom. But, you know, typically, 99.999% of, of the time, government is utterly incompetent. You know, but because it's powerful and has control of lots of money and the media and all kinds of other stuff, it always makes itself look good. It always downplays its failures and plays up its successes, and thus people stupidly believe the government is something other than what it is. Utterly incompetent, utterly wasteful, inhumane, criminal, thieving, murderous, dishonest, propagandist, and unnecessary. That is what government is. It is unnecessary and all those other horrible things that I mentioned. People in the Middle Ages did not freak out and demand that their rights be taken away when a giant plague hit, a plague that killed a huge percentage of the population, and yet humanity survived just fine. We don't have to give up any of our rights to survive coronavirus, and the next virus as well. We can survive those things just fine without restricting anyone's rights at all. And if you don't want to contract it, don't go outside. There's, and if you, if you can't afford to not go to work, you know, if you're like, well, I can't afford to just stay home for weeks or months or whatever. Well, that's also government's fault. Because if it weren't for government, if there were no taxes and no overregulation and all that, there'd be way more entrepreneurialism. Every, you know, ex-exers would be out of the workforce. Everybody would be making probably at least two times as much money, if not three times as much money. And then you would have huge savings. And you would be able to stay out of the workforce for months. You know, there's no reason that we should have our rights restricted so that people can feel better about the situation. Emotional comfort about having your rights taken away to deal with the pandemic is a temporary comfort. But when the crisis is over and the pandemic is completely over, the diminishment of your rights remains. Your rights, your freedoms, don't come back. The problem goes away, but the tyranny that you allow to increase does not go away. You know, we should not tolerate these cowardly sheeple allowing our rights to be taken away. And yet our rights will be taken away because we live in a sort of democracy sort of, and people are idiots and the government lies endlessly. It's endlessly dishonest. The only way to prevent our rights from being taken away is to form our own country, and the seed of your own country is a commune or a no-go zone which keeps the cops out so that the government cannot enforce its retarded rules on us, and so that we can make our own rules on how the community is to be run. Sane rules, you know? And if you keep the cops out, then you can spank your wives, even if the U.S. government has outlawed such behavior. If you can if you can keep the cops out, you don't have to pay taxes, no matter what the government says. You know, if you can keep the cops out of your community, then you can have freedom. If you don't have a community that you can keep the cops out of, though, then you're not free and you never will be. It's really that simple. Maybe now you see what I mean when I say that the only thing that matters is power. Even if you think it's a horrible tragedy that people will die of coronavirus if we let everybody get it without trying to stop the virus, you should still say that we should let it happen anyway because freedom is more important than life. You know, give me liberty or give me death. I'm not callous about the laws of human life, but compassion is not an excuse for irrationality, nor, you know, advocating for slavery, you know, that is increased tyranny. Love is inherently irrational, which is partly why XXers are so irrational, but truth is more important than compassion. Not much more important, but it is more important than compassion. And if you don't think that freedom is more important than life, then go live elsewhere. Go to another country, because that's the belief that this country is founded on, along with other beliefs, like the populace being, you know, white and Christian, and the money only being gold and silver, you know, no fiat currency, as well as the country was, America was also founded on distrust of government. It was founded on, you know, morality, a Christian religion, you know, whiteness, you know, um, distrust of government, and, uh, you know, uh, other, other good things, like, you know, basically, well, not unlimited freedom, but huge freedom. Right, like this is the stuff that this this government was founded on originally, you know, 240 years ago or whatever. Um, so you, if you don't believe in distrusting government and you don't believe in extreme freedom, then you're not an American. You're a traitor and you should get the fuck out. It's that simple. Um, you know, the, the founding fathers knew the government was evil. They were very clear about it. And the people being vigilant and not letting government gain an unfair amount of power, i.e. I keeping government weak and small, like, like the what I'm saying is like the people... The, the Founding Fathers, they founded the country on the knowledge that government is evil and that you have to distrust government. And they also founded the country on the, the principle that the people have to be vigilant and they have to not let government gain an unfair amount of power. That, you know, America is founded on the idea, idea that you've got to keep government tiny and weak. And that's, what is, that's, you know, what we did for a while. But, you know, then we lost our vigilance and we stopped using gold and silver and we let our government get huge. And, and then our country lost its cohesiveness 
due to losing its moral and religious and racial cohesiveness, and then we stopped distrusting government, we foolishly started trusting government, and then we allowed immigration, and then we let the government get huge, monstrously huge, monstrously expensive, monstrously tyrannical, etc., and we have consequently become poor, brainwashed, disempowered, etc., all because of our trust of government and our, our basically, but fundamentally, from our cowardice, our unwillingness to walk away and our unwillingness to overthrow the government. Ideally, most people would get coronavirus and have their immune system strengthened, and those who wanted to avoid it because of it being because of being old and old or sickly, those people would stay in their homes and the virus would die off, and then they could once again come out and not be at risk of getting the virus. You know, I'm not all about like let the weak people perish, fuck them, I don't care, I'm strong, so who cares about the poor people? You know, that's that's not my attitude. But I'm accepting of the idea that weak people have to be allowed to perish. If that's the cost of maintaining freedom, then that's the cost of maintaining freedom. It's not a, it's not a pleasant thing that, you know, some things are going to come along and kill weak people, but, you know, if that's the cost of preventing government from taking even more of our freedoms, if that's the cost of maintaining freedom, then that's, that's just what you have to do if you're a sane person. This has been Redshift. Peace.